Hi, this is David with David's Tutorials, and this is vlog post number 23-43. I have put out 43 of these vlog posts since March the 15th of this year, 2023, and I'm very happy that I've been able to put out that many. This one is going to be Scuba Tales. It's basically my memories of my experiences with scuba diving. <laughs> Now, scuba diving is a fun activity. It's not something that you want to take on without good training. Now, when I was young, very first getting started in my career, I joined the Air Force, as you've seen in some of my other videos. And the second base I was stationed at after pilot training was in Okinawa. Now, Okinawa is an island south south who east of the mainland of Japan. It was a Japanese island until World War II when America basically conquered the island and it became an American territory for 30 years. And in about 1972, they had reversion where America gave Okinawa back to Japan. But I was there in 1971 through 73. Now, one of the best things about Okinawa, it's in the middle of the South China Sea, and they have excellent scuba diving. While I was there on Okinawa, I got with the Kadena Air Base Morale, Welfare, and Recreation Department, and they had scuba diving training classes. And I took these classes, and these classes lasted about two weeks. And in the class, they would teach you such things as the mechanics of diving, such things as every 33 feet you go down, you get another atmosphere of pressure. So the pressure of atmosphere at sea level is 14.7 pounds per square inch. And when you go down 33 feet, it doubles that. And you go down to 66 feet, it doubles it again. So the deeper you go, the more pressure there is. Of course, that's because of the weight of the water on top of you. When you're scuba diving very shallow, like six feet, there's almost no weight on top of you and you don't have to worry about it. But when you go down deep, then the nitrogen and the air you breathe gets into your blood much more so than when you're breathing at sea level. And if you ascend, come up to the surface faster than the nitrogen can get out of your blood by breathing it, then you get something called a bends, and that's very painful and it can be fatal. So they teach all about this, about how you have to go down and you have to have the chart, how long were you at this depth and what you have to do to decompress on the way up. And these are the types of things they tell you. Also in that class, they tell you about the sea life that you need to watch out for, such things as jellyfish and the different kind of jellyfish and anemones, and anemones are pretty much every everywhere and sea urchins, which had the spikes all over them. And in the South China Sea, they had sea snakes. Now, sea snakes are snakes that live in the ocean. And they told us that the sea snakes are either the second or third most poisonous snake in the world. They are very, very poisonous. And if they bite you, then it's basically say goodbye. But the good thing about it is that sea snakes are not aggressive. So if you see a sea snake, you don't have to worry about screaming and getting out of the water. You just ignore the sea snake and the chances are very good that the sea snake will just ignore you. And they taught us all about this kind of thing in this two weeks or so of classes. It's two weeks as I remember it could be different because that's been a minute ago. It was probably 1971, maybe 72 when I took these classes. Well, the other things they taught you were about the equipment you had to have, such as a weight belt to, you want when you're scuba diving to have neutral buoyancy. In other words, you don't want to be swimming, and if you quit swimming, either bob to the surface or sink down to the bottom, you want to have neutral buoyancy. And I discovered at that time, I need to wear a weight belt of four pounds for me to have neutral buoyancy when I go scuba diving. It's just an interesting thing to know. And they teach you about the various type of scuba tanks and regulators, and you have the I think the 2200 PSI tank and that lasts so long. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can get a 3000 PSI tank and that'll last even longer. And all the various kind of regulators and gauges and equipment like swim fins and a dive knife. And they recommend everybody have a dive knife and just keep it with them at all times. It's a tool and sometimes nothing else will do. 
accept that. And so we learned about all of this good stuff. And at the end of the class, of course, they took us out for two or three dives for our final certification. And when we graduated the class, we got both the NAUI NAUI and the PADI PADI certifications. And we got cards that said we were certified that and everything else. And that, of course, those cards allowed us to check out equipment from the dive shop and to go out on the dive trips. And they would look at the certification and make sure we were qualified divers before they would let us go on these dive trips. And that was really neat. But the other interesting thing about Okinawa, it's an island. And of course, islands are surrounded by water. And water is a perfect place to go scuba diving. Matter of fact, who goes scuba diving anywhere except in the water? Well, you can go freshwater, saltwater. And of course, around Okinawa, there is saltwater. Well, I went scuba diving many times while I was in Okinawa. Sometimes I went with my squadron. That's my Air Force unit. It's called a squadron with my squadron friends. And I'll tell you about one of these dives. Um, I was a co-pilot, and my aircraft commander was a man named Roger, Roger Peters. Hi, Roger, if you're watching this. And we went diving um, off the, I think it was the west coast of Okinawa. And an interesting thing about when you go diving in Okinawa, there are very few sand beaches in Okinawa. Most of the beaches there are coral rock. And if you've ever seen Coral Rock, you know it's very bumpy and very jagged. And if you walk on it in bare feet, you're going to slice your feet to ribbons. And you don't want to do that. So when we went diving, we basically had to wear sneakers. First, we had to wear them to go out from the beach into the water to get deep enough to go swimming. But that also meant that you either had to take off your sneakers and then hang on to them somehow while you're diving or do what I did, which is simply buy a set of swim fins that would fit on over the sneakers. In other words, they had to have a, a hole for your foot that was bigger than your foot, but it would accommodate your foot and the sneaker. And that's what I did. And that was kind of a neat thing to do. But when we went diving with our squadron friends and Roger Peters was with me, we were out diving and we encountered some sea snakes. We're basically just uh, in anywhere from 15 to 40 feet of water and just looking around on the bottom, looking at all the neat wildlife and the brilliantly colored fish. They just had the most beautiful fish there in the salt water in the shallows. And we would encounter all kinds of wildlife. We could see moray eels. Sometimes they would be in a, a coral rock cave and they would be edging their head out of it and their mouth would open and close. And moray eels are also dangerous. They're not poisonous, but they will bite and they will take a piece out of you if you let them. So you want to be really careful about that. And we encountered sea snakes on this dive. And when we came back from that dive, Roger Peters told us that this sea snake, he was just in the middle water, he wasn't at the bottom, he wasn't at the top, minding his own business. And he saw this sea snake come up to him. And the sea snake came up and it looked him right in the face. And then it turned around and it flew around the back of his head and it came around again and it kind of hesitated in front and it went around again and it went around the back and it came around again. I think he said he did it three times and it came again and it looked him right in the face and it approached him and it tapped him on his mask three times, tap, tap, tap with his nose. And then it just looked a little bit more and then it turned around and it swam off. The sea snake was just curious. What is this creature that's in my domain? And it explored it. And Roger was a little bit frightened, but he had gone to the class and he knew that sea snakes weren't aggressive. And uh, when you encounter a sea snake, basically you just ignored it. So he clenched his teeth and he ignored the sea snake and it went away. But that was a whew, an interesting situation there. Now, another friend I went diving with, he was a civilian teacher at the U.S. government school for dependent children in Okinawa. And he was a marine biologist and he taught biology classes in the local American high school. And we discovered that we both like scuba diving and we became friends and we went diving a lot together. 
several times we would go out diving in water that was somewhere between 15 and 30 to 40 feet deep and he had a slurp gun. Now a slurp gun is basically a rectangular cylinder made out of plexiglass. It's clear, you can see it in the water, but you can see right through it as well. And inside this plexiglass cylinder, it had a uh, plexiglass closure on the back and it was open in the front. And through the closure in the back, there was a hole and through that hole there was a plexiglass rod and fastened to this plexiglass rod was another plexiglass piece of rectangle that would fit inside the rectangle of the tube and it was at an angle like about 45 degrees to the angle of the if the tube was like this then the plexiglass plunger was at a 45 degree angle now about three quarters of the way back from the mouth of the tube towards the back of the tube, there was a hole in the bottom and under that hole was fashioned a mesh net bag. I think it was made out of nylon. And what you would do if you had the plunger all the way out at the end of the tube, you would approach a fish that you like that looked really cool and you want to like for your aquarium and the fish would not be scared of it because it was basically clear and the fish could see it, but it didn't look threatening. And then you pull the plunger out fast and it would suck that diagonal plunger back in, pulling all the water with it. And when it hit the stop, it would be right over the hole in the bottom and that would suck in water and the fish with it would go right down th past that 45 degree angle piece and go right into the mesh bag. And so basically you would slurp the fish into the bag. And we caught a lot of fish for his aquarium. And I was enjoying this so much that I went out and I built my own aquarium. My navigator on my flight crew at that time had been a journeyman glazier. So he and I got together and we each built ourselves these 50 gallon saltwater aquariums and uh, basically we just had to buy the glass and the silicon glue and put it together and then buy all the equipment to go inside the aerators and the hoses and of course there in Okinawa we could go out and we could get uh, the the rough sand the coral sand and the coral pieces to go in there and even we could buy get some we didn't have to buy it we go out and harvest some uh, saltwater seaweeds that would go in there and it would make the aquarium look really neat. And so I built my own aquarium and so I used my friend's slurp gun to catch the fish for my aquarium. And in that aquarium I had uh, a RAS, W-R-A-S-S-E, -S -S -E, that would go around. It's kind of like a saltwater catfish and sometimes it would go up the side of the aquarium and eat the algae off the side. And I, oh, the most beautiful fish over there, I think it's called a blue damselfish. It is a brilliant, bright blue. And it's only about an inch or two long, but it is absolutely gorgeous. And another fish we could get, and I caught a few of these, are clownfish. If you've watched the movie Seeing Nemo, Nemo was a clownfish. And uh, you could catch these, but if you caught one of these, then you should also harvest an anemone. Now, anemone, it basically looks like a sponge with a bunch of soft, wavery fingers. And an anemone, it lives by catching fish it will sting you. It has little trigger cells in there that if anything brushes against them, these trigger cells fire and they shoot the toxin into whatever it's poisoning. And usually a fish will go by and it'll brush into one of these tendrils and it'll get stung and the, the tendrils will wrap around it and the anemone will feed on that fish. But clownfish are immune to anemone stings and they live right in the anemones and the anemone gives them protection. And the clownfish also, when the anemone catches something, it will, of course, uh, somehow pull it apart and the little pieces, the, the clownfish will eat those. So it's a symbiotic relationship. The clownfish hides in the anemone and other fish say, oh, I'm going to eat this clownfish. And they come up and the anemone gets them and then the clownfish feeds on the fish that was going to eat him. So it was neat. I had a clownfish and an anemone in my aquarium. Oh, and I also had a barber pole shrimp. Uh, I caught this, I believe, with a slurp gun. It's a very thin and delicate shrimp. It looks like a shrimp, except it's 
really thin and the legs are long. It almost looks like an underwater mosquito. It, the legs are that long, but it is bright scarlet orange and white in alternating uh, stripes, and so it's called a barber pole shrimp. And I had one of those in the aquarium, and that was just a lot of fun to be able to go out with a slurp gun, catch fish, bring them home, put them in my aquarium, and put them in my friend's aquarium, and put them in my navigator's aquarium, and it was just a fun thing to do. Two more stories, then I'll be done. Another story is my friend and I were diving. We decided we were going to do a deep dive, and we went down to about 110 feet. Now, you can't stay long at 110 feet without doing a lot of decompression on the way up. So I was only down there about three or four minutes. But I had the slurp gun, and I caught a clown trigger fish. Now, at this time, a clown trigger fish, it's a very rare fish. It's very much in desire by saltwater aquarium enthusiasts. And they're willing to pay about $600 at that time. And this was in the early 1970s for a clown trigger fish. But I didn't sell the fish. I basically just gave it to my friend for his aquarium. Because when I brought it up, he's, oh, you got a clown trigger fish. I love clown trigger fish. I've never been able to get one. So I, I just gave it to him because he was just so generous with me with his time and his expertise and everything else. So I didn't really need the fish. I didn't want to sell it and have somebody else who I didn't know get the fish. So I, I gave it to my friend and I was happy to do that. So I like to tell people, one of the things I've done in my life is I caught a fish worth more than $600, more than 100 feet under the ocean. Well, it's true. I did. And it was a clown trigger fish. Now, the final thing I want to share with you is when my teacher friend and I went on a night dive. Now, a night dive in salt water is a true adventure. The first thing you notice when you go underwater at night is the noise, the sounds are so much different in the daytime. The first time you dive, it'll be in the daytime, and you'll hear sounds, but you're not going to notice them because they're not new and different because this is the first time you're doing anything. Everything is a new experience, so you're just taking it all in. But after you dive in the daytime several dozen times, you kind of get used to the daytime sounds, and if you go dive at night, the sounds are totally different. There are clicks and scrapes and moans and grunts and just all these strange sounds underwater at night. And of course, you have to take a flashlight with you. And it's got to be a waterproof flashlight. But we saw critters underwater at night that we've never seen in the daytime. I saw lobsters that would come out at night. Uh, my friend actually, when I was not with him, he caught a giant warm water lobster. Now, the difference between a warm water lobster and a cold water lobster is the cold water lobsters have these giant claws, and the warm water lobsters generally either don't have them or they're very, very small, just like on the end of their front feet. Um, but he caught one. It must have been 20 pounds. And he said the way he caught it was he just reached down and he grabbed it by the back of the carapace, and he pushed it right up against his wetsuit on his chest. And while it was there, it couldn't do anything. Of course, it was scrabbling and trying to get away, but he was holding it there, and he swam up to the top where he had an inner tube that had a bag in the inner tube, and he put it inside the bag in the inner tube, and he had a wonderful lobster dinner. But on that night dive, we had a great time. Now, that was my diving in Okinawa. I want to tell you one more diving experience, and it's the only diving experience I had in the United States in salt water. My diving experience in the United States, I came back from Okinawa. I met my wife in a class at the University of Florida, and we got married, and we were living in Pompano Beach at the time, and she decided she wanted to learn how to scuba dive also. So she took classes, and she got certified, and then we went on a dive organized by the shop where she took her lessons, and we went to the only totally underwater state park in the entire country, and that's John Pennekamp State Park which is off the coast of Florida, down in the Key West area. Now, John Pennekamp State Park, as I said, it's totally underwater, and they have put a number of reef building things, junk cars. I think they've even sunken a ship in that area. But once you put stuff down on the bottom of the ocean, it very quickly becomes barnacle encrusted and becomes a home to wildlife, undersea life, and we could go swim in that area. Now, two memorable things happened on that one dive that I had 
in the United States in salt water. And the first memorable thing was when we went down there, I looked off in the distance and it looked like it was far away, but it was probably only about 50 yards because the water wasn't totally clear like it was in Okinawa. I looked over there and there in the distance was a school of barracuda. Now, if you're familiar at all with big fish in the ocean, you know a barracuda is a torpedo of a fish with an underslung jaw and really mean teeth. One of the things that they told us in dive school was that a barracuda is attracted to things that flash. For example, if you're out there diving and you're only wearing your bathing suit and you lift up your arm and it sees the white underside of your arm, it might think that's a fish belly and it can dart in. It's like 60 miles an hour and it can take a chunk out of you in a heartbeat. So that's one reason that when I went diving, I always wore an old long sleeve shirt, a long sleeve button up shirt and a pair of jeans. I, at that point, I just couldn't afford to go buy a wetsuit and I didn't want to spend the money on it anyway. But I was wearing my long sleeve shirt and my jeans for diving when we went out into Pentacamp. And I saw this school of barracuda and I think, ooh, these are there's like eight, 10, 12 of them out there. And they were just hanging there. And the Gulf Stream is a current that flows around the state of Florida. And they were hanging there in the Gulf Stream, basically still. They were probably swimming at two or three miles an hour to maintain their position, but they were just hanging out there. And I was hoping fervently that they had just had dinner and they weren't really interested in anything else right now. And it was just scary to look at and know that every single one of those could swim at about 50 or 60 miles an hour and take a chunk out of you if they really wanted to. So it was like, mm -hmm. I wasn't real happy with that. But the other memorable thing was we went down to the bottom and there was a lot of coral and growth and seaweed and ferns and uh, just all these other things. And I found a moray eel. Now, I remembered what I had done with moray eels when I was in Okinawa. And so I motioned to my wife and said, hey, look at this. And I got out my dive knife and I went over there and I kind of poked at that moray eel. And the moray eel, he doing his mouth like that. I didn't think anybody could scream that loud underwater. My wife was not real happy that I was poking at this moray eel. So uh, I... I basically gave that a rest and didn't do that anymore. But that was my experience of diving in the United States. And not long after that, um, I went back in the Air Force and kept all the scuba diving equipment that I had bought over the years when we went to Maine. Of course, there was no scuba diving in Maine or none that I wanted to do. And after Maine, we moved down to Alabama. When we got to Alabama, I just put an ad in the paper and I sold all my scuba diving equipment. And I just haven't been scuba diving since then. But it was a fun phase of life to go through scuba diving. And I hope you've enjoyed coming along with me on this trip down memory lane and just enjoyed hearing these stories about scuba diving in Okinawa and in John Pennekamp State Park in Florida. As always, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give me that thumbs up. If you do that, that will let me know you enjoyed the video and it will let the YouTube robots know that, hey, people like this video, we ought to recommend it to somebody else. Leave me a comment down in the comment section. Tell me how you like this video. Tell me that you're going to share it with other people, okay? And if you're already a subscriber, thank you so much. I do appreciate every single person who has subscribed to my channel. And if you're not a subscriber yet, why not go ahead right now and click that subscribe button and then the bell icon so YouTube will let you know by email when I post another great video right here on David's Tutorials and Vlog Channel. Meantime, everybody have a wonderful day. Take care and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.